Καλησπέρα σας, καλώς ορίσατε σε ένα ακόμα overplay. Κατευθείαν από Μόναχο έχουμε μαζί μας έναν παίχτη που έχει παίξει και στο Παναθηναϊκό και στην Πάγερ Μονάχου, έναν πρωταθλητή Ελλάδας, έναν αγαπημένο της πράσινης εξέδρας, a fan favorite, big time player. James Gist is with us. Thank you so much for your time, James. Thank you for coming on the show. How's everything? Everything is going good, man. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me today. And uh, mm -hmm. definitely appreciate you guys taking the time. Looking forward to this interview. Name of the show is called Overplay. Let's get straight into it, yeah? Sounds good. All right. Let's start with being a part of history. How about the one and only trade in EuroLeague history? Uh, what was going through your mind when that happened? You know, having the chance to play for an elite club and play alongside 3D. And do you feel like the EuroLeagues should uh, try to introduce trades and make it a little bit more fun? Um... You know, at the moment when it happened, I was uh, I wasn't so optimistic about how it would turn out. You know, um, after having probably not my best season playing at Fenerbahce the year before, um, and then coming into Malaga, you know, I felt like that was kind of a year for me to kind of re, you know, uh, revamp myself, revamp who I was as a player. And uh, you know, during that season, that first part of the Euro League season, we were first place in the Euro League. You know, so I didn't understand when the trade happened. The trade happened. I just, I didn't understand it. And so once the trade took place and I found out I was going to Panathinaikos, you know, the, the coach at the time, um, the Asman Repesa was basically saying that no team could win with me. You know, it, it wasn't possible. I wasn't a player that helped teams win. So it kind of put a stain on my name as well. And so I kind of was going to Panathinaikos feeling like, man, this is, might be my last chance to really make a statement and be able to continue to play at this level, you know, at the highest level in Europe. Um, and fortunately, it, it turned out to be something really good. You know, it, it turned out from getting traded to Malaga to playing seven years in Panathinaikos, you know, and, and ended up probably being the best, one of the best trades ever that happened. Um, in regards to EuroLeague trying to, you know, implement more trades, I think it's uh, something that may possibly happen in the future, but I, I just think a lot of dynamics have to go into that, you know, because you're, you're not only – you're playing in the same league, but you're going from a different country, you know. You're going to a totally different culture depending on where you're going to, you know. A lot of things go into play with that, you know, unless players are with their families, you know, you can't just up and leave your family in another country, you know, because you're going to play. So, I mean, you have to consider that if, uh, if a player has kids who are in school or – you know, many, many different factors that happen into it. Now, if it's as simple as just contract for contract, player for player, um, I think it could be possible. But I think it's just, it's a lot of things that have to go to consideration, man, when you think about it at this point. Got it. So, so I figure this is a little bit more complicated than we think. You know, maybe yeah. with specific restrictions as far as countries, like a uh, player has a clause, I can't be traded to Moscow or, you know, right. I can't go somewhere yeah. super far. All of those things can be, you know, when a contract, any player, you know, can put whatever they have in their contract, you know, to say these things. Or even teams can put that, you know. Teams can put that. Uh, you wouldn't see, I guess, somebody go from Red Star to Partizan. Or you wouldn't see somebody go from Olympiacos to Panathinaikos, you know. Yeah, like that, that would happen, yeah. You know, NBA, you're still in America. You're not really going from one country to another, you, you know. You get traded from uh, L.A. to Detroit, though. You get traded from LA to Detroit, maybe it's a little bit different, but you're still around people that speak the same language as you. It's not like going from Turkey to Serbia or Russia to Italy. You know, it's like it's a huge difference. I remember when Blake Griffin got traded to uh, I had him on my fantasy team. He when he signed the contract with the Clippers, the big contract got traded to Detroit. NBA TV, uh, they were saying hey, they got ATMs in Detroit, man. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on into your uh, seven-year stay at Panathinaikos, some amazing moments. Uh, how about sweeping the back-to-back -back EuroLeague champs? Uh, what was the best moment of your Panathinaikos career? Was it that championship, you know, beating, beating the back-to-back EuroLeague champs 03, or was it coming back down from 2-1 and winning a championship, uh, you know, with your backs against the um, ball? I felt like, that year that Olympiacos won the EuroLeague and, and we ended up winning uh, the Greek title and we swept them 3-0, I felt like that was our EuroLeague to win. You know, uh, we lost to Barcelona. 
we went to game five. I think we had game four in Oaxaca, you know, to close it out. And we lost that game, unfortunately, and had to go back to Barcelona. But as a team, I felt like we we hit our peak maybe one week too late. You know, it was just like, you know, it's all about timing and stuff with that. And uh, we knew as a, as players and as a team in the locker room, we knew that we were the best team that year and we deserved that year league title. So when we had the opportunity to play Olympiacos, we knew that it was our time to just show and prove that they're not the best team in Europe right now. You know, a lot of people were upset because it's like, oh, Olympiacos won the finals. Uh, they're the best team. And it's, it's like, you know, that's better for us because we know we're about to win the Greek league right now. <laughs> um, so, I mean, that was kind of like, I, I don't want to say a redemption thing, but it was like, you know, we were able to make a statement that we had a really good team and that if we continue to build around this team, that we could do something great in the future. Uh, the year that we came back, you know, I think Frankie was the coach. I just might have been the coach that year. Um, yeah, yeah. And we came back uh, and they had the break. You know, they had, I think they had home court advantage at Seth, or maybe we had home court advantage. I can't remember. Um, but that was a very difficult series, man, because, you know, our backs were against the wall. They won an important game. And then we had to go in there and actually win to come back to Oaxaca. Um and that, that, you know, you just, you were able to feel relieved after that series. You know, you felt like you really accomplished something. It, it wasn't, it wasn't as simple as that first championship we got. And not to say that that was a simple championship, but we dominated that series. This series was a lot different. And I mean, you know, the rivalry between Olympiacos and Panthinaikos is never, it's never going to go away. You know, those things, uh, those things are hard to, to, to get past, but to say which is which was better, man. I might gotta go with the comeback. I might gotta go with the comeback. That comeback year might have been probably better. Max against the wall makes it a little bit sweeter, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I'm walking in the locker room, and the trainer had put like the newspaper writings of Olympiacos already talking about what they were gonna do once they got the championship and everything like this. And I, I got pissed off, man. I got pissed off when I ripped all the newspapers down off the wall. And I was like, you know, I don't I don't care about we shouldn't care about what they're talking about. We shouldn't care about nothing that's going on outside of this locker room. The only thing we need to worry about is what's going on in this locker room and what we're going to bring to the game. And everybody just kind of looked at me like I was crazy. But I, in that moment, I was I was pissed that we were talking about them. Everybody's talking about them. Why? You know, we still got games to play. We go in there and win. We got another game. The series is different, you know. And uh, I think it sparked, I think that helped spark the turnaround, you know, in that series. But we went in there, we, we were about business. This is one of the best things he used to say. It was like, you know, there's things about, there's probability and there's possibility. And he was like, you know, with the numbers and everything that's happened right now and the way we're playing, the way they're playing, is it probable that we're going to win? Probably not. But is it possible? Yeah. Anything is possible. We'll circle back to those years. I just I just want to reference uh, the Barcelona series because uh, Palahniakos has a really big opportunity to go to the back to the final four. Uh, the the last time Palahniakos won on the road in the playoffs was that step back three uh, D hit when uh, you guys were were there the Pedulares yeah. team. Uh, where do you think that series was decided? Was it the fact that you guys weren't able to close out at home? Was it a specific matchup, too much pressure after becoming the favorite, after being able to break? What do you think decided that series ultimately? I think that, I mean, it, it, it could be a number of things looking back. We lost game one by one or two points. I think I might have missed the free throws in game one, you know, down the stretch. I missed the first one and I missed the second one on purpose trying to get the rebound. And, uh, you know, we lost that game and then 3D came out, second game and hit that, that three-point over Nate July you know, to give us a chance to take it to Oaxaca. Uh, I think we won game three. Um, but it, game three wasn't a convincing win. You know, it was a it was a difficult win. It wasn't like, you know, we're coming and there's no way we're going back to Barcelona. It wasn't as convincing as you, as, even though we won, it just wasn't as convincing. In game four, um, we lost that game. And I think that we kind of had that, that, what Pedulakis used to call it was like a big game syndrome. You know, you 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 get you kind of buy into the hype, you buy into the crowd, you buy into trying to make the biggest plays to make the crowd go crazy, as opposed to just doing the simple things to win the basketball game. You know, what got us to this point was being tough, was being simple, not doing all the big crazy plays, but just playing hard in those basketball. 
I think in game four, you know, a lot of us kind of caught that big game syndrome, trying to make big plays when we need to just make simple plays. Barcelona, they had the experience. Um, you know, they had – it's not like they hadn't been there before. Pasquale, Chavi Pasquale, you know, he, he's been with that team for several years, so they all kind of knew each other. This was our first year together as Panathinaikos. You know, so we were making a run, you know, after the Abradovich era. Nobody expected Absolutely. us to do this. You know, nobody expected us to be there at that point. Um, it was 30,000 so people saying, in the block. So what you're saying is, let me put this in U.S. terms. Uh, when the coaches say, don't try to hit a home run, just try to hit sing singles. Is that yeah. what happened in that game four, yeah? I think that's what happened in game four. I think that's what happened in game four. And then, you know, once we realized that, oh, the, the, the home runs aren't coming, and we tried to do this simple shit. The simple shit wasn't working either. Got <laughs> it. Was it just got like, it. Okay. But the game was still tight. I mean, it was still a winnable game. But again, it just wasn't convincing. And and Barcelona ended up running away with that win, man. We we had a chance to close it out in Awaka. And we lost that opportunity. Um, going back to Barcelona, game five, they had the momentum. You know, that was a difficult game to try to win. And we still only lost by like three or four points. We still only lost by three or four points, but I feel like maybe had we won game one, we wouldn't even be talking about going back to Barcelona, you know? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, after a double break, for sure. But do you, do you yeah. feel like this is the best opportunity for Ben Athenaikos to go back to the Final Four? Because because there's another series that that I, I've written down right here that we, I want to talk about, you know, the Real Madrid one. Because Tanasa Docubo said some fun stuff to me about a month ago when I saw him back in the States. Do you feel like that... You know, throughout these years, because you had the Basconia series also, um, which where you know the one where Mike James and Adams were hitting these crazy yeah, shots. We, got, from we didn't, didn't have a chance in that series. We didn't have a chance in that series. I was pissed that we even had uh, matched up with Barcelona. I mean, with Basconia, because we lost the Ephes. We lost the Ephes the last regular season game. If we win that, we match up with Barcelona. We beat Barcelona twice that year. You know, it was like one of those things where it was like the better matchup for us would have been Barcelona that series, not Basconia. You know, okay. because they had Mike James, they had uh, what was it, Darius Adams? I Darius think his Adams, name was. yeah, those guys were killing yeah, it. Those guys, Banga, were... Kim Tilly, um, they had uh, who's the the shooter? Baruses? Uh, they had Baruses too. They had Baruses, but we weren't worried about Baruses. You know, Rajulitsa was kicking Baruses' ass that series. Oh, for real? So it wasn't, he, he wasn't the issue, but Bertans, you had the shooter Bertans. Oh, okay. And, uh, I mean, you got a guy 6'10 coming off of pin downs, knocking down threes. That was tough. Jakob Blazic played a huge role in that series. I mean, it just was a bad matchup. It wasn't that they were like we were a bad team. It was a bad matchup for us. Okay. Specifically. I think had we had Barcelona, we would have had that. We would have won that series if it was Barcelona. But when we lost to Ephes, uh, the rankings changed, and we matched it with Basconia. And everybody was like, oh, we got Basconia. And I'm like, hmm. I don't. I don't like that matchup. Yeah, my friends, my friends were already booking tickets for the final four that year. I'm not gonna lie to you. Yeah, but, I mean, it's weird you would say that because if you would ask me, uh, okay, so you got Basconi or Barcelona or, or nine out of ten hoop fans, they would say stay away from Barcelona because the, you know they're still they're still a good club. They get they get a a couple calls here and there. You know the breadcrumbs. Uh, so it's yeah, interesting that you say that. That's it's because, really interesting that's point because of view. you guys are. That's because you're thinking about it from a fan standpoint and the name, the name on the jersey. You're not yeah. thinking about it from a basketball and an analytical point of how we match up player for player. You know, Basconia had Mike James and Darius Adams, who averaged 20 points on us in the playoff series. That, that playoff series, they averaged 20 points apiece. Yeah. So when the plays broke down, it wasn't like you couldn't stop the plays. You could stop the plays they were running, but when the plays broke down, they were one-on-one -on -one players, and we didn't have enough to stop them. Got it. You know? And then on top of that, they just had the energy from the wings. Um, you know, they, they played a style of basketball that wasn't beneficial to us. It didn't, it didn't match with us. So it, it that's why I say Basconia was not a good matchup for us. And it was, it was a surprise to everybody that we lost three zero. But for me, I knew that it was going to be, it was going to be a lot harder than everybody thought it was going to be. It's never easy to win at Basconia in general. To win there is not easy, yeah. you know, in general. So it's just one of those things where, you know, and we had a chance to win one game there. I think we went to overtime. Overtime, yeah, 3D, um, 3D hit a big shot. Yeah, the hit a three. Game, yeah. Mitzos hit a three or something like that, sent us yeah, to yeah. overtime. That game, we should have won. Now, had we won that game, the series might be a little bit different. But either way, it still wasn't a series that was going to benefit us. If we had Barcelona, I guarantee you we probably would have we we went through that series. That you know, this is 
this is one of the times where I actually love what I do uh, to get to pick the mind of a pure hooper and for you to educate me as far as basketball stuff. So, so let's go into more series. All right, let's go into, uh, let's go into the Fenner series first. You want to do Fenner series first or the, the Real Madrid series? The one where you guys, could, the 20 to, we could talk, 20 to zero. We could talk Fenner. We could talk Fenner. All right. All right. Talk. Let's go to Fenner. So the Fenner series, I actually, actually left the States back then. It was Easter. I came back. So I had a, I have a full, uh, you know, full grip on the series. Uh, what do you, what do you think the side of that? Th those guys, they played a little bit un unorthodox with uh, Ekpe Udo and Jan Vesely. That's two bigs. So they were really good defensively as far as that. And then they had obviously Bogdan, big-time player in the NBA, Sluki. What what made the difference in that series? Because I remember both home games, Panathinaikos had a lead, especially I think the first one, you guys had a big lead, right? We were up 16. Going into the fourth, we were up 16 points and lost by 16. You know? Yeah. And in the NBA, that might be nothing, but the EuroLeague, that's just a lot. I mean, that's everything, especially we had only lost one or two home games that entire season. The regular season, you know, we had home court advantage. We hadn't lost at home. I think we lost to Olympiacos at the buzzer or something like that um, during the regular season. That might have been our only loss at home. Oh, the previous um, game winner, right? That's, that's yeah, the, the previous yeah, game that's winner. The, that was a close I game. That's the only, I think that's the only game we lost at home okay. all year. Okay. So, I mean, we were rolling. We were steamrolling, and everybody knew that had we got home court advantage that year that we were almost guaranteed to go to the Final Four, right? Um, you had Bogdanovich, who was an amazing player. He, he had a great series. Udo and Vesely was probably one of the best duos I've ever played against, only because just the dynamic that they had where you had Udo on the short roll and you had Vesely on the baseline. It's kind of like pick your poison. You know, do you do you let Udo continuously shoot the hook or the, the, the short mid-range jumper? which he was knocking down, or do you step up and then let him drop it off to Vesely, who's going to finish with a dunk nine times out of ten? Um, those were, you know, three players that really carried the series, but the one player that was the X Factor in that series was Kalinich. Kalinich killed us. He was right? shooting maybe 15% from the three all season long. In the playoffs, he shot like 60% from the three-point line. Our, our whole plan was, okay, we're going to help off him. We're going to give more help to Vesely on the low post when Udo has it so that we don't have to help so much from there. And we're going to give Colinish a shot. He wasn't making threes all year. And that game, he made like four or five from the corners. And it was like, damn, like, all right, now that he's knocking this down, what do we do? You know, you kind of got to readjust your game plan, along with Bogdanovich scoring like he scored, along with Udo and Vesely, you know, giving their double-doubles and, and, and the attention that they were giving around the rim. Um that was kind of like when Colinich made those threes, it was kind of like a hit in the mouth that we weren't ready for. And then after you lose that game one, mentally, you're like, damn, <laughs> we weren't <laughs> supposed to lose. Like, we were supposed to win this. We were up 16 going into the fourth. Yeah. There's no way you lose that by 16, you know. Yeah. And after that game, you kind of saw um, a different kind of Panthenikos, man. I think Obradovich gave a message after the game and said, you know, see, they're not unbeatable. They're not unbeatable. And he that's kind of what put a battery in their back to come back even stronger the next game. You know, and then we mess around and go down 0-2. Now you got to go into Istanbul. Full arena, you know. Uh, they had everything. They had the momentum. They had everything. They had the momentum. And um, they were really they were a really well-coached team, you know. And, and one thing that I've learned through my experience over the years is the teams that had the most discipline and, and stuck to the game plan no matter what, how the game plays out. You stick to the game plan. You stick to what the coach is telling you. Those are the teams that, that go on. Those are the teams that go on. That's that's just been, you know, through my experience. And, and what's crazy enough is Fenerbahce went on to win the championship that year. You know, we lost to the championship team. It wasn't like we lost to a bad team. Absolutely. We weren't a bad team, but we lost to the team that actually won EuroLeague that year. So it's like, you know. Uh, that you guys played Real Madrid and you played yeah. arguably the the best for, uh, first quarter uh, that Panathinaikos played in the last 10, 10, 15 years. Dominating Madrid in the first game. Mike James cooking you, Nick. Uh, Thanasi said said uh, something to me in Greek that we played for the Fanella, which means that that we played for, for Panathinaikos for the pride uh, that that team was super talented. Plus, we played for the emblem on on our jersey. So yeah. I, I'm interested to hear your point of view in regards to that. Um, 
you know, we, after the loss that we had against Fenerbahce the year before, coming back um, the next year and getting Madrid, we just, we had something about us. We had a different walk about us, you know, and it was like, you know, after that first game, uh, we felt like we were going to dominate the entire series. You know, even prior to that, like it was just we didn't think anything of it. We didn't think anything about Madrid. We didn't think anything about who we were going to go against. It was just whoever we were going to go against, we were going to try to we were going to try to destroy. Um, And that first game was a pure picture of what we were and what we were about in that series. Um, You know, what's crazy is after that game, I think we had a day in between and then the game was the next two days later. Uh, Pablo Lasso, I don't even think they went to the gym to have practice or anything like that. I think it was just kind of like, you know, it was one of those things where he had his team told them, okay, game one is out the way. We got to have another game, but you know, let's, let's forget about it. That's over. You know, and the the, the second game we come in there, it was just a different, a different vibe. You know, they, we didn't catch them off guard. They weren't, they, they were ready for the punches that we were throwing. And as talented as Madrid is, you know, they had Doncic, they had, you know, Rudy and those guys, man, they they shoot the ball really well. That's the dangerous thing about Madrid is is the efficiency that they can really shoot the ball at. And to play a team like that in the series or to play a team like that in the finals, you know, if they're really having a good day that day, they're almost impossible to beat, especially when you, you know, now that they have Eddie Tavares in the mix, you know, it, it they're almost one of those teams that it's just like it's unfair to play against, you know, to a certain extent, depending on on the day. Tavares is really kind that of good a cheat code. I'd agree with that. He's kind of a cheat it's, code. I mean, because, I mean, the, the, the guards don't really got to play defense. You know, it's like, go ahead, take a chance. <laughs> That's, what take a chance the... That's what Kanan told me. That's what told me. He's not, I'm not worried about the guards. I'm worried about Fall and uh, Fall and Tavares. Uh, but, yeah. but we'll, get, we'll circle back to that. I want to talk about uh, your, your former teammate, Mike James. He broke the record. I had the chance right. to talk to James Harden. He's like, yeah, he got game. He was my uh, teammate in Brooklyn. Uh, how proud are you uh, for Mike, man, for, for him to be able to – I mean, he went back to the NBA. He played in the playoffs with Brooklyn, had had uh, the big three, uh, two of the three not gotten injured. I feel like maybe they could have beat the Bucs. KD's foot was on the line. You know, history is thousand, always about a shot, a rebound, you know, toe on the line. thousand percent. Mike is a – Mike is a – Mike is a – a rare talent. He's a rare talent. You know, guys – when you look at the basketball game, you know, you have guys that are excellent jumpers. You have guys that are excellent shooters. You have guys that are really fast. They are great defenders. Like something that they do just really, really good. Mike is a natural scorer. Doesn't, it's not about can he make threes. It's not about can he finish around the rim. His talent is finding the bottom of the basket. You know, playing in practice, seeing him in games, playing against him when he was in Basconia. I've seen Mike do some stuff that you just kind of like, you sit back and you're like, how the hell did he make that? You know, there's no way he made that, you know, and he, he does it. That's just, that's just what he does. He's a natural scorer. And it's, it's something that you, when you get the chance to play alongside him or you get a chance to play against him, you gotta, you gotta enjoy having that opportunity. You know, Um, when I was in Asheville, I love playing against Mike when he was in Monaco, when, um, when I was in Panthinaikos and he was in Basconia, I had been watching Mike James since he was in second division Italy. You know, when he actually got a chance to come to Greece, I think he was playing in Rhythm Noah, Rodos. He was playing Rodos, 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 yeah. And I remember talking to the team like, yo, we need to try to get him. Let's try to buy him <laughs> out. And they was like, no, like, you know, for some reason, I forget what the reason was why they didn't want to do it. And like literally like the next week, Basconia bought him out. He went to Basconia. And I was like, man, we should have got him. And I think when we played Rodos, I think we won by like 10 or 15, and he still had like 35 against us. You know, Mike is just one of those – he's always been like that. This is not something new. You know, now that he's grown, you know, and matured more as a player, um, he he understands what his impact is to the game now. You know, um, if it wasn't for – the things that went down in Cheska, I think, with, with him between him and the Tudis and, and, and all the stuff that happened, I believe that Cheska was going to win the Euro League that year. You know, I think it ended up being ended by COVID. COVID happened and the Euro League got cut short, but yeah, he ended up leaving because of all the stuff that was happening behind the scenes. But that year, I think, was one of Mike's best years ever. You know, he he he's he's a brother to me. We talk all the time. You know, um, that's just 
I'm, I'm proud of the accomplishments that he has. Uh, he's done. And I mean, he he's at the top of his game. He's an NBA player. You know, he's a, he's he's one of those kind of players. And we're lucky to be able to have him in Europe as long as you guys have been able to have him in Europe, you know. Uh, and it's one of those things that you just kind of got to enjoy right now because you don't know how much longer he's going to be playing. You know, you don't know how much longer you're going to be able to witness this. There's not a lot of people that bring that kind of flair and excitement to the game. He he brings that. Absolutely. I appreciate greatness. Uh, we're going to lose all these guys, man. Steph, LeBron, all these guys are going to retire in the NBA, and then we're not going to debate yeah. about, oh, why did he switch teams or why did he create super teams or Mike James right. hasn't won the Euro League. Who cares? Let's just appreciate greatness. You know, pure basketball right. fans uh, know all about that. Uh, let's talk about another offensive talent that's uh, kind of have had everybody in awe. Different type of player, uh, K. Nunn. What have you seen so far? Do you feel like – I mean, I know he's 28, uh, but do you feel like he can have that sort of impact in Europe uh, a la Mike James if he decides to, to stay? Um, I wouldn't compare it to Mike James, but I would just say in general, like for a guy like Kendrick Nunn who's played in the NBA – He's been at the highest level, you know, and he's been effective at the highest level. And that just that lifestyle, everything that comes along with the NBA, you know, being in Miami, I think he was in L.A. for a little bit. You know, when you get exposed to that, that's that's what you want as a basketball player, especially coming from America. You want that. What he's what he's experiencing right now is that it's not just the NBA where you can feel like that. Right now, you're in. Athens, Greece, playing for one of the biggest teams in, the, in in Europe, where you got the fans behind you right now. Oaxaca's rocking right now. You feel that energy. Y'all are at the top of the EuroLeague right now. And you see that they're worshiping you as, and you're winning. You're hitting game winners. And, and you're like LeBron James right now. Everybody's talking about you like that. It's not just the NBA Absolutely. where you can feel like this. It's not just the NBA you can feel like this. You can, you can be worshipped like this in Europe, you know, whether you're in Pat the Nikos, whether you're in a team like Olympiago's Partizan, Fenerbahce, you know, going down the list of the teams that have fans like this, that support their teams and really go behind their teams and, and teams that actually have the money to be able to pay, you know, good for your for for what you bring to the table. He's experiencing that right now. And I think that it's something that if he realizes that he could really make a living off of this and and and, and buy into it, man. You know, anything's possible. He's a really good player, you know, in his first taste of EuroLeague, he's really doing a good job, an exceptional job. Um, and I like to see that, you know. I like to see him go against the adversity. I like to see him, you know, stand tall, especially for Panthenikos at that. But I think right now what he's realizing is that this, this shit is different than the NBA. And almost in some ways it could be better, you know, because the, the NBA arenas and the NBA fans aren't like this. They're not like Panther Nichols. So you're not walking into Owaka. You're not walking into no arena in, in the States, and it's like Owaka. I promise you that. You know, so for him to be at the top in the driver's seat in that moment, I think it's huge. I think it's huge. I think that it's something that he has to sit back and, and, and really think about. You know, being 28, you're just now getting to the, the to your prime years. From 28 to 32, at least for the next four or five years, he's going to be top level. He's going to do stuff that's going to surprise himself. And he could possibly be doing it for Panther Nichols. He could be doing it for a top team in Euroleague, getting paid really good money with a really good fan base, you know? And that's something to consider. Do you want to go back to the NBA where you're not going to be the star player? You're going to get paid good money, but you're not going to be the star player. Are you doing it just for the logo or are you doing it because you really love the hoop? If you really love the hoop, I think you stay in Euroleague. I think you stay in Europe, you know? That's where you're going to be. You're going to be appreciated a lot more. As far as yourself, you were here for seven years. Um, a lot of success, uh, especially with the switching, the Padulaki switching, putting you on Billy. Uh, hats off to you, man. You had to guard possibly the greatest ever in, in the Euro League, uh, Spanulis, and then uh, a top five power forward all time or top 10 power forward all time in, in pre disease. You had to guard both of them in the game. So I got to ask you, what was going through your mind preparing for? Like, all right, I got to guard this guy in the low post. And then if I switch, I got Spanulis. Uh, what kind of a motivation was that for you? Was that stuff that, that that kept you up at night, that got you hyped up? Talk about preparing for those games to have you guard those guys, man. I mean, for me, being a, a power forward center, you know, a big player, I always took pride in my defense. 
I always took pride since I was in college, you know, playing for the University of Maryland. I always took pride in, in switching on smaller guards or guards that were really effective offensively and them, you know, kind of backing the ball, like clear out, clear out. I'm about to go one on one. I love that. I yeah. love that because I know that I'm going to be a difficult task for you to try to score on. I know that nine times out of 10, you're probably not going to score on me. And in your mind, you really think you are. You know, and if you give, if I give you 10 possessions, I guarantee you, you might only score two or three. And if you do, they're going to be difficult shots and you're not going to continue to attack. It's not going to be worth the game plan to try to do. So I always just took pride in those switches of being able to go against smaller guards or guards that were just, you know, offensively gifted like that. You know, with Spanoulis, you know, he was, for Olympiacos, he was everything. If Spanoulis didn't have a good game, Olympiacos didn't have a good game. You know, that was the thing. I mean, Pretezis is as talented as he was and as gifted as he was offensively. He was a magician on the post, man. Just Pedralakis used to say he was Greek dancing. You know, it's like dancing. He's just he, he's down there and he, he can never you 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 have to be able to move with him because at the same time he's just that good. He has that touch, that push floater. You know, it's almost impossible to guard. He could shoot it from anywhere on the floor, you know. Um those are two difficult guys to have to play against. But, you know, it was just motivation for me because I was a defender. I liked it. It didn't matter who I was going against, whether it was Penulis, whether it was Teodosic, whether it was, I don't know, you can go down the lane uh, with all the guards that I've ever played against. You know, even Jesekevich is when he was at Barcelona and Navarro. Um, I loved those switches. I loved it. It was for me, like, I knew that if you keep attacking me, in about four or five possessions, you're going to be getting a sub because coach told you stop attacking me. You still <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I, I just know that this is going to happen. I, I've gotten people, plenty of people taking out the game because they went against the game plan of attacking me, you know, and that was just one of those things that I just took a lot of pride in to this day. I still take pride in it. I still love playing defense. I still, you know, love that opportunity to be able to go up against it. I mean, with guys like Spinoza and Pertezis, man, they, they're so great as players that it it's only – respect it's only respect for me to give my best against a player like that and to be able to share the court with those guys you know it made it all it made it so much more special and meaningful you know because they were who they were they won multiple euro leagues they're going down as the best players to ever play in europe you know i got a chance to compete against them uh you had a lot of success uh, as far as winning cups winning championships but i got uh three spanulis game winners in my notes and I'm sorry to ask this question, but I got to ask you which one, if you could tell me, which one It'll pissed be, you off the most? The one that I still think about to this day is the one that he uh, made over uh, the MTDs. Okay. For me, that was like, a, it was like a knife in the heart. It was kind of like a passing of the crown because Mito was retiring. You know, he was going to be out um, after that, and Spinulis was kind of taking over. So, I mean, I think it was something that kind of had to happen in history. But looking back at it as a basketball player, I'm at the top of the key right next to him. I think I had Hackett maybe. It was either Hackett or Montrez on the wing. And, I mean, it's 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 Mito. You know, he's got 10 defensive players of the year. It's like I know he's got it. You know, I know he's yeah. one-on-one with Mito with, with Spinulis. I know he can handle that. I know he there was no issue with that. And in that moment where Spinulis was going to sidestep, I don't even think he sidestepped to the right. He sidestepped to the left, which was more towards me. And in my mind, I was thinking, go double on this shot to try to bother it. But also, I didn't want to give up a shot to Montrose or Hackett for that buzzer beater helping on Mito, who's a great defender. You know, yeah. I was kind of stuck in between a rock and a hard place with that decision. And instinctively, I should have, I probably should have went because I maybe would have bothered that shot. But when he made that shot, it changed everything, you know, and it, it was one of those things that it was like, damn, I think about that to this day. You know, the the shot that he hit um, in Seth for the EuroLeague, again, like I said, you, you you give you take your hats off to great players when they make great plays. I think he might have had six points the entire game. He wasn't scoring anything. But in the fourth quarter, you know, with two, three minutes left, you know, Billy, he was kill Bill, man. That's for crazy. years, he was known as the most dangerous player in the last four minutes of the game. I don't care what he did the rest of the game. I didn't care what he did with the rest of the game. It was what he would do in the last four minutes. He was he was that good. 
Um, and he he pulled that shot and stuff, and it was like all I could do was laugh. You know, I, I smiled. I was like, damn, he yeah. hit it. I didn't expect him to pull up so fast. I thought he was going to take a couple more dribbles and try to get to the three point line. He pulled up from basically the hash mark. You know, um, great instincts on his part. He made a big shot. The thing with Nick, Nick played amazing defense in that situation. You know, he was all over him, and I mean, Spinoza made a shot. You know, you can't you can't really. There's nothing you can ask for in those situations to do anything better. Anything closer, anything else is a foul. You know, you're going to get three free throws out of that or something like this. But um, I would say the one that I think about the most is the one that he hit over Mito. That's the one I think about the most to this day. I want to ask you about your relationship with DPG. He's he's back cooking, uh, putting a lot of money, bringing big players, you know, re retooling his team. Uh, just as a any relationship, I'm sure ups and downs. I got we got an iconic photo of you two celebrating together, uh, and we got the the return from uh, from Turkey, you know, with the bus. Can you talk about the, your relationship? Oh, uh, I mean, DPG is a great guy, man. He's a great guy. You know, this is somebody that I've managed to build a relationship during the time I was in Panthers where we got on, uh, we were able to get on the same page. You know, when I was going through the stuff um, with my daughter. Uh, back in America was going through uh, some legal situations. You know, he really stood by. He understood that, you know, my family was more important than anything else. Um, for DPG, it's the same. His family is more important than anything else, you know, and uh, the previous owners with uh, Pablos and his uncle and his, and his dad, you know, those, um, Panther Nichols is a family. It's a family, you know, and that's that's how he feels about the team. That's how he feels about the organization. That's how he feels about Pow in general. And that was something that we could relate on, you know, because when it came to family, nothing else mattered. Um, and the heart, the sweat, the tears, the blood that he puts into the to the team, you know, he expects for everybody to have that same kind of passion about it, you know. Um, I would say his reactions, he's very reactionary. You know, his immediate reactions can definitely be off the wall sometimes, you know, and then he sits back and he thinks about it and he, you know, he comes back down and it's like, okay, you know, now he makes maybe better decisions in those situations. But in general, like, he really is a great person. Man. He's a great person. You know, he's an owner that you definitely want to have on your side. You don't want to have him against you, you know. Um, and what he's been doing the past couple of years, you know, trying to revamp, what a walk and what Panathinaikos is, you know, opening the budget up, bringing in more people, trying to redo Owaka so that it's more fan friendly. You know, all of that stuff that's going into the organization, it just shows, you know, how dedicated he is to the, to the team and to, the, to, to everything about it. Um, and over the years, man, he's been so close to bringing back these, these, these championships, the Panathinaikos on a year league level. You know, we've been so close. We were close. When we went to game five of Barcelona, we were close when we went to game five with Cheska. Uh, we were close, you know, that year that we had Real Madrid and we blew them out the first game, but then we came back and lost the next couple of games. You know, we were we were close in a lot of those aspects. Um, but we never got over that hump. And so for him, who's so passionate, man, he, he, he deserves it. He deserves it. The team deserves it. The fans deserve it. Like, you know, it's been long enough. It's been long enough. Man, the Nagels got six titles. You know, they're a respected team in Europe. And that's just one thing that, you know, people have to realize, people have to understand is that Panathinaikos, as long as they have the fans behind them, as long as they have the players involved that are willing to play like the necessary for that jersey, not for the name on the back, but for that 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 clover, you know, that that means everything when you put that, you know, in front and you're like, I'm here, we're here as a team, we're here as a family. When you play like that, and that's what Panathinaikos is doing right now. They're that momentum that they, these guys have, you know, they're, they're a team. They're a team right now. And that's that's the most important thing going into these playoff series is that they're they're united, the chemistry is strong, and that they they can maintain this this momentum going in because that's what's gonna push it through. And DPG has done a great job as far as building the team and, and putting it in this in this direction. He's he's doing the right thing. And so Lucas, I, I would add that that adding a guy with the experience and the winning caliber of Costa Lucas is just as important. What was your reaction when you saw the signing? You know, considering you're you're aware of of the rivalry right. and that stuff like that almost never happens. What was your initial reaction to the transfer? I mean, my biggest thing was that you know, okay, it's not the first time a player has gone from one team to the other. I mean, you see 
Spanulis went from Panathinaikos to Olympiacos. Papa Petru came from Olympiacos to Panathinaikos. Lojeski came from Olympiacos to Panathinaikos. Um, Slukas, who was such a big part of Olympiacos' success, uh, to see him sign, it was like, wow, like, you know, okay, he's coming to Panathinaikos. I mean, he's Greek. You know, if, if Olympiacos don't want to sign him or doesn't want to give him the money, you can't get mad that he wants to stay in Athens and Panathinaikos is willing to pay him. You know, like, it's just, there's a business side of it too. It's not just, you know, the loyal loyalty side to it. Um, and so when I saw it, my biggest question was that how is he going to adjust to dealing with the outside noise? Because he's a good player. Like you said, he's experienced. You know, he knows exactly the timing of things. He knows how to read things. He's a veteran. He's a veteran in the game. Uh, he knows how to win. So he was definitely an important signing. And also somebody for the locker room, you know, who speaks Greek, you know, who can manage to bring the Greek players together. Um my biggest thing was how is he going to deal with the outside noise when when things aren't going good and the fans and the media start to bash him and Olympiacos start talking crazy like he lives there he has to hear this stuff you know but at the same time he's managed to to keep his composure he's managed to work under pressure and this kind of pressure is enormous and uh, I mean he's been doing a good job he's been doing a really good job and as you see the team is doing a good job I mean he played big in this last game I think in Munich he played big. You know, he played big um, in, in Bologna. You know, he's been playing big as as his position in the team. And I'm happy to see that he was able to to push through this. You know, I'm happy to see that the fans are starting to accept him. Maybe you probably still got far and few that talk and say things. But, I mean, this is a part of the game. You know, not everybody's going to love him. Um, but it, it's, it's good to see. It's good to see. Because I know that when it happened, the first thing that came to mind was, like, I hope he can adjust to dealing with this. I hope he Because, I mean, even when Barusas came to play with Panthenikos, he was catching a lot of flack from the fans, you know, from, from when he played in Olympiacos. So, I mean, it's just – it's not the first player to ever have to do it. Let's just say that, you know. It's not a surprise. Got it. Got it. Uh, James, there's another thing I have here in my notes. There was a lot of rumors while you were here. You were here for seven years. I feel like there's a law that says once you're here for – X many years you can get a Greek passport. How close were you to obtaining one? What what occurred? Three, did you guys did you get ever ever get into that or was it all months. rumors? Three months, three months because I got traded in December from Malaga to Panathinaikos. Um, that was in 2012. I stopped playing what in 2019, 2019 June. If I come back August, September, October, November, I make up those three months, you know, up until December, I make up that time and that ends up being my seven years. So I played for seven seasons, but it's not seven full years. It's like six years and nine months. It has <laughs> so, to be seven calendar years. Got it. Seven calendar years, I believe. Uh, at one point I was trying to get naturalized. I wanted to play for the, I wanted to play for the national team, man. I really wanted to play for the national team, but they were saying that the Greek national team wasn't using naturalized players. Uh, now you see Thomas walk up is playing and it's like, dang, I couldn't, I couldn't get that same deal, you know, but times have changed, you know, it is what it is. Uh, really would have loved to get a Greek passport. My son was born in Greece. You know, my firstborn son was born in Greece. So he has the opportunity to be able to get one. Uh, but uh, in general, uh, yeah, I was six months, six years and nine months instead of seven full years. Got it. Got it. All right. Uh, so I got this or that. I got spicy, funny or cool story. And then this or that. Which one do you want to do first? You got a story for me? Give me something spicy that we haven't heard of. Something funny that happened maybe on a trip. Something from the locker room. Something a speech. I don't know. G give me something good from from your time here in Panda. Give me a cool story that nobody's ever heard of before. So the first time I actually met DPG, man, uh, he had a, he had a, a team function at his house. He had a team function at his house. I, and this is my first year in Panther Nichols, obviously. Um, had no idea who the owner was, anything like that. And so we're sitting there, we're eating dinner. The whole team's there. My wife is there. At the time, we weren't married, but she was there. Everybody's so full. You know, Marcus Banks. We got everybody there. Um and join the party. And as we're, we're walking through the house, I, I walk past this van and I'm like, uh, when you get a chance, can you can you tell me where the owner is so I can thank him for, you know, allowing us to come to the house and and, and enjoy, you know, this time and stuff like this. And he's like, I'm, I'm the owner. <laughs> and I'm looking at him and I'm just like, 
I'm looking at it like, wait, no, nah, you can't be the owner. Like, is, I'm looking at Dimitri, and it's like, no, there's no way you're the owner. And he's, I'm the owner of the team. I'm, I'm down to Copeless. And I was just like, damn, like, I felt totally, like, embarrassed. I was embarrassed in that moment. Like, shit, like, you know what? I'm sorry. You know, I just want to say thank you. It's a pleasure to meet you. You know, at the same time, you know, we really wanted to just give our, our thanks for, for having us here. You know, that was probably, like, my first all shit moment in, in Panathinaikos. I mean, I had no idea. Um, another story I could give you is probably when we found out about riding a damn bus from Istanbul. Okay. <laughs> Back to yeah. Athens. I'm here for that. I'm here for that. You know it. Uh, so, you know, after we lose the game, we lost 3-0. Guys are pissed off. I mean, we don't leave that night after the game. We obviously leave the next day. We knew we had a flight the next day. We get up in the morning. I feel like our flight wasn't supposed to be until the afternoon, maybe like 1, 2 o'clock. So we got up, or maybe around 12. We got up for breakfast. And as you wake up in the morning, you know, guys, this is when, you know, Twitter is real active, Instagram, all that stuff. We're all starting to get messages on our phone, like all around the same time, like pings and everything. Everybody's like, I hope you enjoy the ride back to uh, to Athens. All of this stuff. Like, these are the messages we get. Me, Kalathis, uh, Kenny Gabriel, Chris Singleton. You know, everybody's looking at their phone. These phones are just going off. And it's like, yo, you guys are going to be riding. You're driving back. I hope you guys are going to enjoy walking back to Athens. Like, all of these messages are coming through. And we're sitting in the hotel. We're at, the, we're at breakfast. And nobody's saying anything from management. You know, we had the, the general manager was there, the coach. Our head coach, Javi, was there. Everybody's there. You know, we're all talking and nobody's saying anything about our trip or our travel. So we're sitting at the table and Nick is just like, finally, like, yo, is anybody going to say anything about, you know, what what all these messages are? Is it, is, is there, are these messages that we're seeing right now saying that we're not flying back to Athens? What is that about? So our GM and coach, they, you know, they stand up, they come over to the table and they're like, um, Yana Koblis has canceled the flight. <laughs> We ordered a bus to leave from here at two o'clock or three o'clock in the afternoon. And we're going to drive back to Athens. And it was just like one of those moments where everybody's sitting here like, what are you, like, are you serious? And they're like, how long is that ride? The ride is 17 hours. And we're like, hold on. Let's think about this. We got a flight that could really be 45 minutes, hour maybe, you know, back to Athens. And now you're telling us that the flight is canceled and we got to get on this bus. And also, it said anybody that did not ride the bus back was going to be, their contract was going to be cut immediately. And so now it's like, all right, what are we going to do? And the moment I was like, I had just came off an injury. I got hurt earlier that season. I had surgery and I came back earlier that season. So I was really considering not riding the bus because I couldn't be sitting still for that long at the time. But I also was in the middle of a contract negotiation to be extended two more years. So I was kind of like in a rock or hard place. If I don't get on this bus, negotiations are probably over. We're not going to be talking about this no more. Um, and some of the guys decided not to get on the bus. Some of the guys were like, man, look, we just got to do what we got to do. And this was just the end of year league. We still had the rest of the Greek league to play. We still had regular season games to play, and we still had to go into the Greek league playoffs and eventually try to beat Olympiacos at the end of the year. Um, there was some decisions that really had to be made in that moment. And I was one of the guys that ended up going on the bus with the rest of the team. I wasn't one of the guys that flew through the airport. Um, but in that moment, when we got back to, to Athens, you know, we had to address that situation because he made it clear that whoever didn't get on the bus wasn't going to be uh, playing with the team the rest of the year. And that was what Kenny Gabriel, Adonis Fosis, Chris Singleton, and Mike James. No way we're going into the playoffs without these players for one. You know, I think that's where Chavi came in. And Chavi, you know, as great as a coach as he was, he kind of really stood for the team. And it was just like, you know, we got to, in order to keep the team together, we need to do this. And, I mean, I'm almost assuming that he guaranteed we were going to try to win the, the, the Olympiacos, I mean, the, the the Greek League title. And if we did that, I think that was contingent on everybody returning. Because I think if we lost that series, that the entire roster would be gone, you know, at that point. Um, but it was one of those moments, yeah. We woke up, man, and literally we found out within a couple of hours that we were no longer taking a flight. We were going to be riding the bus, and that was 17 hours. 17 hours back to Athens. That was probably the longest bus ride I've ever been. I'll tell you that. Uh, James, as far as Nick uh, is concerned, uh, great guy. I had a chance to, to chat with him a couple of times. Uh, number one in assists, uh, you know, breaking records continuously. We had that famous Rick Pitino quote where he said he's the greatest passer he's ever seen. 
Uh, I know I know you guys were tight, he's throwing you a lot of lobs. So before we get to this or that, can you, can you comment about Nick and uh, his career in the Euro League so far, and what, what kind of a player he is? And we'll get to this or that to end the show. Nick is a definitely. I mean, he's a dominant guard, man. He's one of the top guards in Europe still to this day. And I mean, Patino is right. You know, he's one of the he's one of the best passers that I've had the opportunity to play against, play with. Um, and I mean, I played with some great guards. You know, even Diamantidis, he was a great playmaker, but he wasn't a point guard. You know, it's different when you have a, your point guard that's making these plays for you. And with Nick, like his ability, his court vision, and his ability to make passes at the correct time and not only the correct time in the perfect place where you can get it and nobody else can get it. It's just like, that's a talent. That's a talent. It's, I play with so many guards that can't make simple pick and roll pocket passes, or, you know, they can't catch you in stride when you're going to the basket so that you can just take it straight to the rim or they can't put the ball in a, in, in a good place. Like I play with guards like that. And for Nick to be able to equally do that with his right hand and his left hand is like, it's crazy. And it's like, you know, but he also has that, that 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 factor in his mind where it's like he trusts you so much that he's going to throw the pass. It doesn't matter how the pass looks. It's going to get to you. He trusts that you're going to make the play. He trusts that you're going to finish it, you know, and even if you don't, it's not like he feared about making a turnover. No, he doesn't fear that. Of course, he's great at not making turnovers, but the passes he makes, a lot of players aren't making those passes because they're afraid that, okay, it might go out of bounds. It's going to change the game. Nick is throwing that pass. If you guys get eye contact, and sometimes you don't even need eye contact. He's already in his mind thinking two, three plays ahead. Perfect. All right. This or that final for prediction. Let's go. You ready for this or that? This or that. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. Pac or Biggie? Ah, I'm from the East Coast, so I'm going to roll with Biggie. I love Pac, but I'm going to roll with Biggie. Jordans or Yeezys? Jordans. Life on the line, one shot. Fotsis or 3D? Hey. <laughs> a lot of times I gotta one. go. I gotta go with Mitraki, man. Wow. Bunyas, man. Bunyas, he made some big shots for us too, though. He made some big shots for us too. Um, but I, I gotta go with Mitos, man. I gotta go with Mitos on this one. All right, folks, but, don't don't hate me for that, man. Because I, I I roll with you. You know, I still talk to folks to this day too. But I'm rolling with Mitos. All right, Batiste, Mike Batiste, or Kyle Hines. If you think about it, Kyle Hines is what the most decorated American player in Europe, right? Yes, Got sir. the most Euro League, all of that. So I mean, he wins. He's he's winning. Uh, I might got to roll with Mike Batista. <laughs> That's the OG. <laughs> oh wow, I didn't expect that one. All right. Yeah. So Mike I'm sorry, maybe he's tough, but I've been looking forward to this uh, interview for a long time. Here's the last one: Greek souvlaki or Philly cheesesteak sandwich? Greek souvlaki. Not even over close. the Philly cheesesteak. Oh, I wasn't even from that one. Not even close. All right. Last but not least, the final four prediction to let Mr. Gistopoulos, Monsieur Gist, Herr Gist, go. Pick uh, Madrid, uh, Monaco, Panathinaikos, and Finner. Appreciate your time so much. Uh, hopefully get to see you soon. Take care out there. Good luck. Uh, no Broco was talking about how you love basketball. Wishing you all the best. It was lovely talking to you. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. Same here, man. You guys take care and good luck with everything else. And especially looking forward to Panther Knights pushing it this year, man. I'm really pushing for them. All right. All right. That's I'm sure Panther fans will be happy to hear that. Appreciate your time. Good luck out there. Lovely talking to you. We'll chat again soon. Take care, man. Thank you. Thank you.